Greetings, motherfuckers, and welcome to this week's edition of 101 Facts. My name is Sam, as always, and today we're here to talk about one of the biggest entertainment companies in the history of, um, entertainment. Provocative magnets of both controversy and quality with wicked humour in there for good measure. No, not the Teletubby Corporation, if that's even a thing. I'm talking Rockstar Games, creators and publishers of Grand Theft Auto, Red Dead Redemption, Bully Manhunt, Table Tennis, some of the biggies. But which game caused uproar from within Rockstar itself? Where would the Warriors' unofficial sequel and spin-off have been set? And is it too much to ask Rockstar to please, please make me a radio presenter in your next GTA game, please? I'm way past playing it cool now. <laughs> hmm. Two out of three of those questions are going to be answered, so prepare a fresh moral panic as we go through video gaming history with 101 facts about Rockstar Games. Number one. Rockstar Games is a video game publisher based in New York City. That's it. Fact one done. Number two. The company has nine studios across the world working on different aspects of various projects. We'll go into detail later, don't worry. But these studios are Rockstar Dundee, Rockstar India, Rockstar International, Rockstar Leeds, Rockstar Lincoln, Rockstar London, Rockstar New England, Rockstar North, Rockstar San Diego, and Rockstar Toronto. Does the word Rockstar sound weird to anyone else now? Because that's only going to get worse. Number three. But let's start at the beginning, where most good things start. In 1984, a group of game developers became regulars at a Scottish amateur computer club in Dundee. These developers were David Jones, Russell Kay, Steve Hammond, and Mike Daly, who would later form Acme Software. Number four. They began working on a project together called CopperCon 1, but when it was taken to publishing companies, it was overwhelmingly rejected. They did, however, manage to sign a deal in 1987 with Psygnosis, a British game developer and publisher, and got to work on their first game, Draconia. Number five. With this contract signed, the lads decided to rename their company to DMA Design, which stood for Digital Memory Access. Draconia was also renamed to Menace, and was published in 1988 and 89 across the Amiga, Atari ST, Commodore 64, and MS-DOS. Number six. Menace was not about Dennis like I thought it was, but it was a horizontal scrolling shooter game. It was set on the planet of Draconia, which is where its former name originated, and the player had to destroy the planet and the dangerous creatures on it. Number seven. This game got mostly positive reviews and sold 20,000 copies, which is pretty good for back then. Point is though, it earned them enough money to develop more games. Number 8. And develop more games they did, it would be a pretty boring and short video if they hadn't. The next game they released was called Blood Money, which was quite similar in gameplay to Menace, and would inspire the development of one of their next games. Number 9. Before that though, they were given the game Ballistics to make a port for the MS-DOS and Commodore 64, and Shadow of the Beast also for porting to the Commodore 64 and the Turbo Graphics 16. Nope, I don't know about that one either. Number 10. Their big break came in 1991 when DMA released Lemmings. It sold 55,000 copies on its first day and 20 million copies overall, inspiring several sequels, spin-offs and expansions, and of course put DMA on the MAP map. Number 11. The incredible success of Lemmings, which is a game about trying to stop animals from committing suicide, just to recap, gave DMA a huge amount of freedom to work on bigger and more ambitious projects. The biggest of these was Race and Jace, which began development in 1995, four years after Lemmings. Number 12. Before that, though, DMA signed a deal with Nintendo to develop a game called Uni Races, or Uni Rally, as it was originally called. It's basically Happy Wheels, but with a unicycle. How has there not been a unicycle mission GTA? I'm getting ahead, sorry. Number 13. The game landed DMA and Nintendo in hot water with the law though, as Pixar of all people took them to court, saying that the unicycle design was copied from their short film Red Dream. Now I shan't weigh in, but unicycles can only look a certain way, really, can't they? Either way, DMA and Nintendo lost the suit and had to cease production on any more copies, so only 300,000 were ever released. Number 14. So back to Race and Chase. It was released in 1997, but under a new name because that one wasn't very good. This name was Grand Theft Auto. Ah, that one never stick, will it? GTA 1 was totally different to the games we know today. Not only was it in 2D, it was also in a top-down perspective, rather than third or first. Still open world though, and still cool AF. Number 15. After being published by BMG Interactive, Grand Theft Auto was met with mixed reviews by critics, but more importantly, it was a huge success commercially, selling more than 1 million copies in just over a year, becoming a bestseller. Number 16. This success meant that game publisher Gremlin Interactive bought out DMA Games before both companies were acquired by Infograms a short later. Infograms sold DMA off to Take-Two Interactive less than a year later. Number 17. Take-Two Interactive also acquired BMG Interactive alongside DMA, and therefore, very intentionally, they now own the Grand Theft Auto property. 
With this game in the bag, Take-Two contacted Sam and Dan Hauser of BMG, as well as Terry Donovan and Jamie King, to found a new label within Take-Two. And that name? Rockstar Games. Number 18. So here we go, Rockstar Games. Being part of Take-Two meant that they could publish GTA in North America, which just furthered their success, really. The Rockstar team were unsurprisingly tasked with making more games just like this one. Number 19. So that's what the team that integrated from DMA did. They made Grand Theft Auto 2. It was published by Rockstar Games and released in 1999 on the PlayStation 1, Dreamcast, Game Boy Color, and Windows. Number 20. Not to get ahead of ourselves here, but it's a pretty similar story for GTA 3 too. DMA developed, Rockstar Games published. It was the first game produced by the DMA crew that featured a third-person perspective as opposed to the top-down or side-scroller games they'd previously made. This would be a theme for all their future games. Number 21. Not long after this, GTA 3 was released, and with this the teams became fully integrated and DMA would be renamed Rockstar Studios, and then two months later, were officially called Rockstar North. Number 22, ooh, ooh. Also worth noting by the way that in 2000, Rockstar published two Austin Powers Game Boy Color games, which is basically the most 90s thing I can think of that actually happened in the 2000s. They were called Austin Powers Obehave and Austin Powers Welcome to My Underground Lair. They were developed by Tarantula Studios, who would later become Rockstar Lincoln. Shagadelic baby, oh yeah. Number 23. In 2001, Remedy Entertainment and Gathering of Developers released their new game, Max Payne. After release, Rockstar were hired to develop the console ports for the game. Take-Two Interactive ended up paying $10 million for the intellectual property rights to the game, which they still have to this day. Number 24. This enormous sum of money would be equal to 15 million now, and was used to create Max Payne 2 with much more creative freedom. Unfortunately, it sold badly, and Remedy Entertainment decided to call it quits with Max Payne. Number 25. It was around this time, by the way, that Tarantula Studios were acquired by Take-Two and promptly renamed Rockstar Lincoln, who would focus on quality assurance of Rockstar games. Basically, they make dem games good. Number 26. It's also when Angel Studios were acquired by Take-Two, becoming Rockstar San Diego. Seems like Rockstar were on a bit of a spree of spending. Before they were bought, Angel had developed Midnight Club and Smuggler's Run, which were published by Rockstar as launch games to the PlayStation 2. They cost $34 million, so get saving if you fancy your own. Number 27. Angel were originally acquired for their game engine, however these titles would see sequels released under Rockstar in the future. They also took a look at games in development and found a fun cowboy shooter game called Red Dead Revolver, which was unplayable in its current state but deemed worth continuing work on. Maybe we'll get back to that later. Number 28. In 2002, Rockstar was still in the publishing games made by others' business, this time coming out with State of Emergency, a kind of weird street beat-em-up for PlayStation 2 and Xbox, as well as a video game adaptation of the Italian job that absolutely no one asked for. Number 29. But hey, back to Rockstar North for a hot sec, because they released Grand Theft Auto Vice City in 2002, and it was a big hit back in Rockstar's home of the UK, making 12 million British pounds in just two days. Number 30. I'm sure I don't need to tell you this, but Vice City is considered one of the best games ever made and raised the bar for gaming as an industry. Obviously though, it sparked protests and outrage. One producer on the game, Jeremy Pope, even vowed to never work on violent video games ever again because of the negative associations that come with it. Number 31. It also caught the negative attention of the Haitian community and its government, with some groups even protesting in the game in New York. Rockstar released a statement apologising for the violence against Haitian characters, pointing out that it's a criminal underworld full of different people on the receiving end of violence. Number 32. Vice City was caught in a pretty weird place when it came to design. It was nominated for the Designer of the Year Award, the nominations of which are on display at the Design Museum in London. However, Vice City was in the strange position of being so graphic it wasn't allowed to be shown, so other Rockstar games were shown in its place. Number 33. Arguably, this was Rockstar's first cinematic venture, as this game had a full voice cast crammed to the brim with talent, from Ray Liotta as Tommy Vercetti to the lofty heights of Danny Dyer as Kent Paul. Apparently, this was quite difficult, as some of these actors didn't exactly hold video games in high regards. Mentioning no names here, Burt Reynolds. Number 34. By the way, Liotta was later asked what the differences were between acting for movies and acting for video games, and he said, cash. It's kind of ironic for Rockstar, for reasons we'll go into later on. Number 35. More or less from here on in, Rockstar and their various wings were pretty much solely in the business of making games that they publish. In that vein, 2003 was a pretty bloody busy year for them as they published and released three games. Number 36. 
In April of 2003, the uber flashy and cool and slick Midnight Club 2 was released, created by those cool cats at Rockstar San Diego. Sticking with a vehicular theme, it's a racing game soundtrack by techno and rap, designed to make suburban teenagers feel like they're in Fast and Furious. Number 37. Max Payne 2 The Fall of Max Payne was also released in 2003, like we mentioned earlier, though this was developed by Remedy, which kind of goes against what I said earlier, but there we are, I did say pretty much, didn't I? Max Payne 2 was actually pretty critically lauded, with a Metacritic rating of 86 for PC. Number 38. However, financially, it wasn't so hot. In fact, Rockstar's parent company, Take-Two Interactive, actually changed their financial forecast in early 2004 to be a bit on the thinner side and cited Max Payne 2's disappointing sales as a big reason. Big yikes. Number 39. Meanwhile, Rockstar North were cooking up one of the most controversial games in existence in the form of Manhunt, which was unleashed upon the world in November of 2003. Number 40. In case you weren't aware, Manhunt is a game in which you play as a death row inmate who has to earn his freedom by killing people on camera. For its time, Manhunt was incredibly nihilistic and gory. This predictably set off a firestorm of outrage in the media. Number 41. But what may surprise you to know is that it also set off outrage within Rockstar itself. At least according to a former employee named Jeff Williams in a blog post. You see, Manhunt was Rockstar North's project, but those at Rockstar Games felt uneasy about it because of the amount of controversy it would bring. The meaning of life. Williams said that some within Rockstar felt the violence was crossing a line because it was unable to be rationalised due to its realism. Gone was the usual argument about it being parody and over the top because it was so gritty. Number 43. The game was banned in Australia, New Zealand, Germany, and weirdly Ontario too because of its violence, and was even mentioned in homicide court proceedings in England, though the link was dismissed by the police and judges. Number 44. The following year, in 2004, Rockstar dipped their toes into a water they had not done so previously. No free feet oh. pics, Karen. I'm oh, sorry. Producing a feature film. It was 2004's Football Factory that marked the new venture. Maybe best not to shout about that. Number 45. 2004 also saw the release of Red Dead Revolver, the very first entry into the Red Dead saga. As we mentioned earlier, this project actually started way before this when San Diego were Angel Games working with Capcom. It was originally called SWAT and was a third person actioner that later had a western theme slapped on it. Number 46. Rockstar Games found Angel Studios because they loved their game Midtown Madness so much they used to play it on lunch breaks. The Hauser brothers were also very interested in the fact that they were making a western, and so made them an offer that they couldn't refuse. They then did refuse, so then they gave them another one, and this time they didn't. Number 47. After the game had stalled so much, Capcom officially announced it was cancelled, but then Rockstar re-announced it four months later. Rockstar San Diego were told that they had nine months to finish it. At that point, the game was in pieces, but hey, they managed to get the thing done. Number 48. And it met average to good reviews, with a Metacritic rating of 73%, but it kicked into gear a franchise that would later become one of Rockstar's best and well-known. Number 49. There are rumours that there were more outlandish aspects of the game that were cut out at Rockstar's request, like a Frankenstein in a bride's dress apparently, but it's also been said that this is complete balderdash and it's not unlike Rockstar to be beyond that. Number 50. But 2004 was also a big year in the Rockstar world and indeed the entire world of gaming, as it was the year that Grand Theft Auto San Andreas landed in a big old lowrider. Number 51. To prepare for San Andreas, teams were sent out to cities all over America, with some members even taken to edgier gangland parts of inner cities for authenticity, something that game director Aaron Garbutt called terrifying. Number 52. San Andreas was a huge success by the way, with Metacritic scores in the low to mid 90s depending on version. IGN even gave it a 9.9 .9 out of 10, saying it's the game that defined the PlayStation 2. Number 53. In fact, it's the highest selling game ever for the PlayStation 2, selling over 17 million copies to date. Wow, it seems like absolutely nothing went wrong with this game, right? Right? Number 54. Wrong, actually, Sam from the fact before. There was of course the bog standard violence controversy, but also a brand new one. All to do with a hackable mod accessing a deleted minigame dubbed Hot Coffee, which allowed players to, um, play a more active role in the protagonist CJ expressing his physical love for his girlfriends. Number 55. This minigame was entirely disabled before the game was released, but that didn't stop some modders being able to access it because modders got a mod. Initially, Rockstar denied the code even existed within the game itself, saying it was just a hacker who made it, but this was disproven by various online forum members who showed how simple it was to access. Number 56. 
This actually caused big trouble for Rockstar. For a start, the game was reclassified by the censoring lads, the ESRB, from M to AO, or adults only. This was only in America though, but it did make it far more difficult to sell. They also recalled the game and had to re-release it free of this naughty code, which probably cost Bear Wonga. Number 57. It was also the subject of a number of lawsuits, God it must be stressful working in Rockstar's legal department, which reached various out-of-court settlements. These include big old class action lawsuits. Number 58. San Andreas and Hot Coffee even changed the law. Hillary Clinton and other senators introduced the Family Entertainment Protection Act in 2005, which made it a federal crime to sell a minor a video game for adults. According to some, Hot Coffee played a major role in the creation of this act. Number 59. Hot Coffee was also explored in 2015's BBC docudrama The Game Changers, all about Rockstar and the releases of Vice City and San Andreas and the legal battles with American attorney Jack Thompson. Rockstar Games president Sam Hauser is played by Harry Potter himself, Daniel Radcliffe, by the way. Number 60. Rockstar Games weren't, weren't best thrilled by the film. In fact, they tweeted the BBC the entire time it was on, asking if Basil Brush was busy and accusing them of making it all up by using light swearing. Number 61. Others, some of whom had previously worked for Rockstar Games and DMA Design, tweeted along pointing out inaccuracies like the perception that a game engine takes a day to build and that it looked like only one bloke built it. Basically, Rockstar weren't happy and even tried to sue the BBC for trademark infringement. Number 62. Anyway, back to the games. 2005 was another big year for Rockstar as they released three of them. One of these was Rockstar San Diego's Midnight Club 3, full of arcadey racing goodness. It's even partially set in San Diego, and had licensed vehicles for the first time. Number 63. The second game Rockstar released in 2005 was a surprising adaptation they'd been working on since 2002. The Warriors, based on the 1979 film of the same name, which in turn was based on a 1965 novel by Sol Urich. Nintendo 64. Several of the cast of the movie returned for the game to voice their characters, including James Ramar. The game even contained some hot beats from the movie soundtrack, although in later remasters these were removed for boring license reasons. Number 65. Rockstar even planned a spiritual sequel, a beat em up in the same vein but without the Warriors license or name. It would have been set in 1960s Britain during the whole mods vs rocker phase, ask your mum about it. It clearly never happened though. Number 66. And finally in 2005 came a GTA prequel, Liberty City Story, set way before GTA 3 in the same city. This game did well for the console it came out on, the delightful PSP, and at 8 million copies was its most successful game. Well done, Rockstar. Number 67. And then in 2006 came the big guns, the one you've all been watching this video waiting for. That's right, Rockstar Games presents Table Tennis. Y yeah, the entire world was confused by that too. The game was made with the Xbox 360 in mind. Rockstar San Diego wanted to see what they could do with its hardware. Number 68. So, they created a game with an intense single focus to see what they could do graphically and gameplay-wise with this new stuff. It also helped that Sam Hauser and some of the others at Rockstar also love table tennis. Number 69... Uh... Paddles. As such, table tennis was the first game to be made using the Rockstar Advanced Game Engine, or Rage for short. Yes, the very engine that went on to power GTA V was first tested out on a bar sport game. Number 70. Vice City Stories, a prequel to Vice City, was released on the PSP this same year too. Respectively, it's the second highest selling PSP game. Number 71. 2006 also saw the release of one of Rockstar's most surprisingly popular and surprisingly controversial games, Bully. Bully sees you playing as Jimmy Hopkins at a boarding school, where he's a bit mischievous but notably sticks up for kids against bullies. Number 72. Its title and content about kid characters from the makers of GTA caused significant controversy before the game was even released. Some UK stores refused to sell it. In Europe, the name of the game was even changed to Canis Canem Edit, though Rockstar didn't specifically say why. That's Latin for dog eat dog, by the way. Number 73. There have been plenty of rumours and whispers about a revival of or sequel to Bully, but the last official comment on it from anybody within Rockstar was from Dan Houser in 2013, who said he still had plenty ideas for a sequel to Bully, but that was nearly eight years ago, so... Number 74. By the way, for those who think we'll see a GTA game with an adult Jimmy as a protagonist, hold those horses. Although not for long, because they're heavy. Dan Houser himself has said that Jimmy is not enough of a degenerate to be a GTA character, so good for him. Number 75. Speaking of 
uh, Degenerates, Manhunt 2 was released the following year, causing controversy before it was even released. Noticing a theme here? Rockstar nemesis Jack Thompson vowed to have it banned, like he did previously with Bully. The British Board of Film Classification even refused to classify the game at all, which is a huge deal, due to its unremitting bleakness and callousness of tone. That's a quote, by the way. Number 76. This resulted in the game not being released in the UK for an entire year after the US got their hands on it. Meanwhile, the US ESRB gave it an adults-only rating, meaning many people refused to stock it. Rockstar re-edited and censored the game and resubmitted. The ESRB accepted it, but BBFC refused again. It was finally released in the UK in October of 2008. Number 77. Also in 2008 came Grand Theft Auto 4, set in Liberty City once again, kicking off the HD universe. Now we've done a whole video on this, and indeed most other GTAs, so we'll keep it short, but it was record breaking in just its first day. With the following records being broken, the highest grossing video game in 24 hours, highest revenue generated by an entertainment product in 24 hours, and fastest selling video game in 24 hours. Number 78. As is somewhat tradition, controversy came with the game, this time with the added complaint of the ability within the game to drink and drive. Australia and New Zealand had parts of the game censored, but for more, check out our specific GTA 4 video and indeed, our GTA playlist. Number 79. Anyway, in 2009, two bits of story DLC, man remember story DLC, dropped for GTA 4, The Lost and Damned and The Ballad of Gay Tony. The first of these contained full frontal nudity, which obviously we can't show, but also raised, you guessed it, controversy. To which Dan Hauser said he hoped the fans saw it as a joke. I mean, no one thought it was serious, did they? Number 80. Then in 2010, along came Red Dead Redemption, another game we've done a whole video on, so we'll be brief. Created by Rockstar San Diego, who made Revolver and written by Dan Hauser, it's considered one of the finest games ever made and one of the most expensive at an estimated near $100 million budget. Number 81. There were some complaints made anonymously online by spouses of staff members who said that they went through periods of long working days and crunch culture to get the thing finished, which Rockstar themselves denied. However, a similar controversy would be repeated for the game's sequel. Number 82. 2011 saw the release of L.A. Noir, a Rockstar game in which you were on the side of the law. What? This wasn't developed by Rockstar themselves though, instead it was made by a company called Team Bondi, who actually only ever made L.A. Noir. Number 83. The game was a huge success, but trouble loomed for Team Bondi, who had accusations levelled against them for unfair working conditions and incorrect crediting. A series of leaked emails suggested that Rockstar would refrain from working with Bondi again, which likely contributed to them shutting down in 2011. Number 84. The game didn't use Rockstar's proprietary game engine known as Rage. Instead, L.A. Noir had a custom engine and made use of motion scan to get those iconic faces. Number 85. Motion Scan used 32 cameras able to shoot at a thousand frames a second to capture every single angle of the actor's face and create highly realistic facial expressions. Number 86. As we continue on this Rockstar Odyssey, we've finally hit 2012 and the release of Max Payne 3, the first in the series to be developed by Rockstar Studios, and boy did we have to wait for it. Originally slated for a 2009 release, it was repeatedly delayed to give it more development time to improve quality. Number 87. Remedy Entertainment, who'd made the previous two entries, in case you didn't remember, weren't completely shut out of development though. As the game approached completion, Rockstar used Remedy as consultants, getting them to play the game and provide feedback. Number 88. Rockstar spent a lot of time researching Sao Paulo, the main setting for MP3. <laughs> MP3. They spent time in the city studying the rich and poor areas, as well as the weapons used by the Brazilian police forces, with particular attention paid to special forces like the BOP, which stands for, get ready, Batalhão de Abraçoes Policias Especias. Nailed it. Number 89. The in-game Unidad de Forças Especias is based on such forces, and the developers also drew inspiration from the Brazilian crime movies Elite Squad 1 and 2, which were all about special forces in Rio de Janeiro. Rockstar went as far as recommending that fans watch those movies ahead of MP3's release, and the game is even bundled by some retailers with Elite Squad upon release. Number 90. You may have noticed that Max Payne 3 also features a new face for Max. In this third iteration, he was played by James McCaffrey, who has voiced him on all three outings. He replaced Timothy Gibbs, who played him in MP2, and Sam Blake, who played him in MP1. Face-wise, I mean. Number 91. Okay, time for the biggie. We've reached GTA 5, developed by Rockstar North and published by Rockstar Games all the way back almost 10 years ago now, in 2013 on the PS3 and Xbox 360. PS4 and Xbox One versions followed a year later, and it's coming to PS5 and Xbox Series X and S in 2021. It will never stop being released. Number 92. We've done a whole video on it before, but this game outmoneyed, if that's a word, all other entertainment products ever. Avengers? <laughs> 
GTA 5 is twice as good in terms of the old dollar dollar bills and according to the Financial Times has made well over six billion dollars in revenue. Number 93. Good job really because at the time it was made GTA 5 cost a whopping 265 million dollars to create and market, making it the most expensive game ever made if you ignore inflation. Taking inflation into account, it's actually fifth behind COD Modern Warfare 2, Cyberpunk 2077, Star Citizen and Red Dead Redemption 2. Number 94. Rockstar designed each of the three main characters, Michael, Trevor and Franklin, on the different types of player. Franklin, the young up-and-comer in the criminal world, represents new players to the game. Michael, the retired criminal, is there for experienced GTA players. And Trevor, who is more than a little unhinged, is there for players who just want to smash and commit violence in an open world. Number 95. As I say, we've done a whole video on it, but last point on this. Rockstar was actually sued by Lindsay Lohan, who argued that one of the game's characters was based on her. GTA 5's Lazy Jones, the lawsuit claimed, looked like Lohan, sounded like Lohan, and wore clothes that resembled Lohan's clothing line. The case was dismissed in 2018. Number 96. Red Dead Redemption 2, released in 2018, was the long-awaited, I mean, eight years, guys, come on, prequel to 2010's Red Dead Redemption. It's fair to say it went down well, with a whopping 97 rating on Metacritic and a tidy $725 million in sales on its first weekend. Number 97. Laszlo Jones, a character who features in GTA's 3 to 5, is actually a real person, and you might have noticed his name in the credits for Red Dead Redemption 2. In the Grand Theft Auto universe, he's a talk show host, but in IRL, in IRL? In RL, I guess. He's actually worked for Rockstar as a writer on the likes of RDR2, Max Payne 3, and the GTA series. Number 98. The script for the main story, centering around the adventures of Arthur Morgan and Dutch van der Linde, was approximately 2,000 pages long, and to keep things nice and simple, the motion capture needed to bring the game to life took around 2,000 days of work. You know, in hindsight, eight years, not too shabby. Number 99. Rockstar also enlisted an army of actors, more than a thousand, to make the game. Only four of these, the voices of Dutch, John Marston, Bill Williamson and Edgar Ross, returned from the OG Red Dead. One of the other voice actors in RDR2 has an Oscar nomination, Graham Greene, who plays Rain's Fall. He got his Oscar nom for Dances with Wolves, but anyway, between them, all those actors spouted 500,000 lines of dialogue. Number 100 Riola. The game was so big that entire missions were removed before release because they actually didn't work technically or were deemed superfluous. In all, five hours of content was cut, including a second love interest for Arthur and a mission on a train involving bounty hunters. Number 101, boy. Grand Theft Auto 6 is the assumed next title in the Rockstar lineage, but we don't know that for sure and nobody knows when it's going to be released. Recently, a supposed map leaked online that appeared to show a vast area including Vice City, but like most things GTA 6, it probably ain't real. So that was 101 facts about Rockstar Games. What's your favourite Rockstar Game game? Let me know in the comments down below. While you're down there, be sure to give us a like and hey, subscribe, join the crew. Red Dead Redemption gang we are. Lovely stuff. In the meantime though, two videos on screen that you're really going to dig. Why not give them a click click and I'll see you there. Goodbye now.